Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks for coming on Moms in Our Time to Read Books. My pleasure. I'm so excited to be here. So Tracy, I have to tell you, when I read your book um, about having great sex after age 50, I read it on my <laughs> laptop, on my lap, surrounded by the kids as they were doing all of their <laughs> random things. And um, my husband was sitting like on the couch on the other side of the couch. Like, <laughs> and all the headers of the different sections like <laughs> oh my god and all of a sudden he's like uh honey uh what are you reading over there <laughs> I <was> like, nothing <laughs> I notice it I notice that you haven't had any other sex people on here I know and honestly I I am sort of prudish when it comes to talking about this stuff so um but I'm excited because you have such great advice on so many things and not just the sex but just relationships in general and so much great stuff in your book and of course you are like oh, thank you. foremost you know Dr. Ruth of our time basically so um so first of all you've been writing about sex forever and you had a number one ridiculously successful bestseller like wrote the book on sex what 20 30 years 30 years ago something um yeah so what was that yeah around about 20 years ago 20 how did 20 you ago, get yeah. started writing about how to have better sex? um well it's sort of by default really I had a big sister who worked for family planning so I think and when other kids were like being told you know told all the little kids stuff I was she was like pushing pamphlets under my door of how to cope with herpes and how to put on a condom and and it was just bizarre and, and all the kids at my school of course found out very quickly that I had a big sister who could answer sex questions so I would be a bit like Otis in sex education I'd be running backwards and forwards between my sister and I and I swear that's what's made me me so unembarrassed talking about sex and then my parents split up my dad had an affair and left my mum when she when I was 15 and I think I became very fascinated with the forces of love and sex um, so I went on I'd love but I loved writing so I didn't quite know which way to go I was like do I become a psychologist do I become a writer and then I um, writing one because um, I've always loved writing and so I ended up becoming a writer who specialized in sex and and um, so that's sort of my thing. I think I was one of the first few people to be called, or one of the first people to be called a sexpert. And uh, my agent was like, I hate that term. I hate that term. And I was like, you don't have to live with it. It sounds like I lie around practicing having sex all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> with <laughs> Calvin Klein models or something. I don't know. Very odd term, that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, are, do you, are you embarrassed at all by it? Like, do people ask you about your own personal sex stuff all the time? They must. They do. They do all the time. But I mean, I've had 30 years practice with it now. So, um, so I don't mind. And, and there's very, I mean, I'll tell you what, I can talk about sex without any embarrassment at all. But what I don't like, and which is people assume the two go together, is I hate vulgarity. I don't like I like people to use the correct term, like penis and vagina. I don't like slang. And so that offends me, but nothing else offends me or embarrasses me. And I, I, I have heard a lot of things from a lot of people, including a nun who wrote to me once about that she'd left the nunnery and was having trouble having sex. And it was like, oh my God, I'm clearly going to hell for helping her with this. <laughs> so, so I've heard all sorts of things, but yeah, I'm the person at the dinner party that people either want to sit next to or try and get as as far away as they possibly can from. Wow. It's that sort of reaction. <laughs> and I love that you've written this manual for people over 50 and over because there's this big sort of question mark. I mean, when I was really young, I was like, well, I'm sure people stop having sex at some point. I mean, I didn't yeah. know. I mean, I'm like, I just, I can't imagine grandparents have sex, you know? And now that I'm like in my mid forties, I'm like, I, I don't know about that. I don't like, oh, what does happen? So your book is so great because you, First of all, you acknowledge the hurdles, right? Physical hurdles mm. that might present themselves. And you're so funny too. <laughs> like, oh, thank you. About like, oh my gosh, like 
how to do certain things. And you're like, if his knees are hurting, you know, let me try getting in this position. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is hilarious. You know, because of course, like as you age, everything starts hurting in different ways. So, and you fully acknowledge that. Um, my gosh. I know, but it is, it was hard not to make jokes along the way every single turn, but, um, but yeah, so I tried, I tried to make it kind of like a best friend who knew a lot about sex by your side. That was the intention of the book. And it's not the sort of book that you would read cover to cover, really. I mean, you can, but it's more like, oh, I'm having issues with this. So I'm going to read this bit and I'm having issues with that. But part of the reason for writing it was selfish because I, um, after, you know, this is my 17th book about sex. Can you believe it? And after all these books, I thought, well, nothing's going to happen to me. I'll be sailing through this menopause and I won't have a libido problem. But I did. And so part of the, the motivation for writing the book was to fix myself with it. Because my desire, I used to have a really high libido. And post menopause and turning 50, it just, it wasn't that it, it, I lost it. It was that I kind of forgot about sex. And it was like, and it took me a while. It was like, this is so strange. I used to think about sex all the time and, you know, and have sex all the time. And all of a sudden it, it just had dwindled away. And it's all hormones, of course. And it's all up here. It's all attitude. You just have to rethink it and think, okay, so desire isn't like it is when you're younger, where it just taps you on the shoulder. You actually have to create arousal. You have to arouse yourself. And I think if you can get your head around that bit, um, you're, you know, ahead of the game, really. That's the, the true secret, I think, of, of, you know, having great sex in the second part of your life. And of course, it does get better. It can get much better than the first half. And you also, ref a lot of people talk about like make a plan for it, right? Like put it on the calendar. And mm. you were saying people think that when they were younger, they didn't plan for it. But then you point out you did plan for it. You like got nice lingerie and you like got linen sheets and you made it all. You had a plan. You just didn't plan it in the same way and you were looking forward to it, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly right. Yeah, as opposed to like, don't put it on for drudgery's sake, you know. No, right? no. And I think I think you can't just put have sex in the calendar. You have to, I mean the good thing to do is to take turns in, okay, all right, it's your turn this week to think of something new to try. So each of you has to come up with a new thing because otherwise then it is just the chore that you're crossing off. But I think it's hilarious that people hate it when you say plan sex or schedule sex. And and yet in every area of our life, we do that you know if you're going to go to a restaurant you research the restaurant you look at the menu you think about you know how you're going to get there what you're going to wear you know in the old days when you could go to restaurants of course but it's it, and yet people hate it when you apply it to sex and I think it's because we have this weird thing about sex that we think that we're born knowing everything that you know the amount of people who say to me oh well as if I'd need to read your book and and the people who say that I feel like saying I think you probably do need to read my book because you're the person that thinks that you're just born a mind reader and probably never ask your partner what they like or don't like. So it's really funny. And the other thing that really annoys me is that people think of sex as intercourse. And this is why sex can get better as you're older, because sex becomes less focused on his penis being the star. It becomes less penetration focused because, you know, women often find sex painful and his erections become a bit wobbly. So it moves away from that intercourse is the main event. And of course it isn't for most women because only 20% of women have an orgasm through penetration anyway. And it moves into more, you know, touch based, slower, more erotic sex. And that works better for both men and women actually. And does that count? You think, like, does that oh, count as having sex? Do you think yes. that counts? Like, if you don't have full-on sex, like, I, like, does it still count? <laughs> Do you See, know I mean? this is exactly <laughs> the sort of attitude I'm trying to get rid of. Listen, sex doesn't have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sex can be, I always say to people, think about a sexual encounter. Don't think about how many times you have sex. Think about a sexual encounter. So if you give your husband a big, passionate snog, on the way, you know, before he goes to work, that's a sexual encounter, that's sex. Sex isn't intercourse, no, 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 it's not. It really isn't. And I think particularly as you get older, the more you can move away from that type of thinking, and of course it counts. Say you get an orgasm through oral sex, does that orgasm not count because you had it through oral sex? Of course it does. I don't know, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I think any, even if it doesn't result in an orgasm, I think any type of sexual and erotic encounter counts as sex. That's what I would describe as sex. Okay. Um, you also talk in the book about how some couples 
become so sibling like over time mm -hmm. that they've been together forever that it's hard to like get out of the rut and that makes you know what happens when you sort of lose that <clears throat> drive tell me about that that's a very common problem for any age i mean depending on it's just a long-term um couple problem isn't it in that we're not meant to be together in la, you know stay together forever and ever and want to rip each other's clothes off and the problem is is that we think of love and sex as being you know very happy bedfellows and they're not they actually hate each other what we need for love and what we need for sex are two completely different things like love like security contentment predictability routine because it makes us feel safe Lust needs, you know, forbidden, erotic, uh, anxiety, you know, do they love me? Don't they love me? Oh my God, they've just touched me for the first time. It likes uniqueness and newness. So the two things, are, you know, we can't have them coexisting in our brain, really. So what happens is most couples, because we don't have sex all the time, choose to let the, you know, most of us want the love elements, don't we? We don't really want anxiety, not edginess and all that sort of stuff. So effectively, this cancels out the sort of lusty desire hormones in our brain. The loved ones cancel out the sexy ones. So then you have the situation where you're, you're feeling like friends. And again, you've got novelty. You've been, had sex a hundred million times before with the same body. You in the same way so of course you're not you know like champing at the bit to have sex with each other so i think the mistake that people make is that they they then think it must mean i'm not in love with my partner anymore well it doesn't mean that it just means that again you have to look at sex differently you're not going to look at each other like you did at the start and want to rip each other's clothes off for apparently no reason other than it's sunday morning you know you have to create desire for each other. And this is when, you know, the other thing that people hate is you have to make an effort. And that means planning new things to do, making sure you try new things all the time, that you, you know, have a really interesting life together. And the other thing I think that really puts the zap back into your relationship is so many couples only ever hang out at home, like all go out together. And there's something really good about seeing your partner through other people's eyes. Like I remember seeing my husband, well, to be husband, walking through a restaurant and I think he's good looking. And I was watching him and all these girls were looking at him. These women were looking at him and I was a bit like, oh my God, what are they doing? And I hated it, but it made me aware like, wow, this is an attractive man. He's not just my miles. He's an attractive man, attractive to other people. So it can sort of slip you out of that oh there's you know miles who takes rubbish out sort of thing and in that nice warm soppy sort of cuddly sort of dopamine feeling and back into that actually you know if i don't have hot sex with him somebody else might so you have to look at your partner through other people's eyes i think to get yourself out of that and it's the hardest question it's the hardest thing to fix so there are lots of other suggestions in the book there's no one simple answer at all and then in case it all fails, you also have a whole section on what to do if your partner cheats on you and like what to do when you like get over <laughs> adultery and, and like, you know, if you, what, what if your eyes are wandering? Tell me a little more about that. Well, I thought I'd better include that because one thing, I mean, for this book, I did you know, research, but also I did hundreds and hundreds of interviews with women, anything from 45 to 80. And they were fascinating. I mean, the, one woman had had her first orgasm at 45. Another one had had her first orgasm at 17. And she was in her 70s with the same person and having this ridiculous sex life like she was having sex about four times a week and I felt really ashamed of myself after talking to her but um I've lost my train of thought now what was I saying oh the affairs yes. but um there was a whole lot of people now I don't know whether it was a bit biased because I suppose these people are going to want to talk to me um but there was a whole group of women who got to 50 and thought right I've had my kids I'm in this relationship that I haven't particularly wanted to be in for a long time, but I've stayed for the kids, I'm leaving now and I'm gonna go out there and I'm going to do all the things that I've always wanted to do. And lots of those things include adventurous sex and they are having the best sex ever. But I just thought to myself, right, if this is happening, it's obviously, ha it happens on both sides as well. It's men leaving their wives and you know, regardless of sexuality, people just leave each other once you hit half a decade, uh, half a century, because it's a time of reflection. So I thought I'd better put in some advice there for people who, yeah, decide, you know what, I've had enough, I'm out of here and I'm going to look after me. Oh my gosh. Or what to do if you're the one that's left on the floor. Yeah, awful. Wow. And then you also include all of these physiological benefits. Like in case you're avoiding sex, here are the reasons why you shouldn't be avoiding it anymore because there are so many benefits and it's not just closeness to your partner. So can mm. you talk a little bit about some of the ancillary benefits you get? Well, 
I mean, physically, I had no idea how just how much sex does boost your, it boosts your immune system. I think men who have regular orgasms over the age of 45 are t- twice less likely to die of a heart attack than men who don't. I mean, orgasms are incredibly good for you. Sex is incredibly good for you. It's just this process that seems to set off the production of so many hormones, like dopamine, serotonin, um, endorphins that do wonderful things for your body. And of course, there is nothing like sex to promote the emotional closeness that you feel with your partner. And I mean, the other um, thing that I think you've probably got from the book is that desire isn't the only motivation to have sex with your partner. There are other things like sexual generosity. I mean, if your partner says, I want to go for a walk and you don't want to go for a walk, sometimes you just go for a walk. You know, it's it's a lot of, I think we get very hung up on this. Well, I'm not going to have sex unless I absolutely feel like it. And then he's got to feel like it or she or whoever you're sleeping with. And that happens quite rare. You, you can't always have these perfect conditions for sex. So I think there are other benefits to having sex, like, you know, just having a laugh, feeling close after it, feeling like, you know, that. And the thing about sex is, even if it's really just boring sex, it's, it still feels nice. There's something nice about sex with your partner. Um, and whether that be a long-term partner or a short-term partner, I mean, sex is pretty amazing. And if you don't have sex for a while, you forget about how good sex can be. And that's what happens to couples long-term or over the age of 50. Women particularly, well, men struggle with erections, women struggle with menopausal symptoms, and it can be a bit like, oh God, this is too hard now. And then it's one month goes past, two months goes past, you know, and suddenly you realize you haven't had sex for a year and it becomes the big elephant in the room. And suddenly, if you aren't used to talking about sex or you feel a bit embarrassed talking about sex, you never talk about it. And it just quietly gets never done again without even a conversation. And that was another thing you added, which was really helpful. <laughs> it was like how to talk to your partner about about Mm. all of this and how to have a nice conversation and how do you bring it up if you're not used to discussing it what are some tips there like what if you what how do you and you even have you have the funniest (laughs) list of of what you shouldn't say to your partner oh my gosh I I should have like printed it out but like all these things like this is not going to help your sex life if you say like this is terrible oh my gosh you're so funny (laughs) I think you'll think I'm unintentionally funny at times um I think people are really often because people aren't that good about talking about sex I mean we are at the beginning we talk about nothing else but how great we are how hot we are aren't we hot in bed and then the minute things go wrong that's when we shut up but I think people blurt out all sorts of things like you know I hate it when you do that or um you know well my ex used to do it like this can I tell you how he did it well that's not going to get you far is it (laughs) you always have to start (laughs) with a compliment so the, the biggest trick is to say um I love it when you do x but you know could you do more of y so it's like a a sandwich you have a compliment what you want to say in the middle and then another compliment at the end and the thing is if you you know I did a tv show where we had to get people talking about sex and couples were so paranoid about it and once they'd had that first conversation that first few seconds of uncomfortableness of could we talk about our sex life I love you and I really want us both to be happy and let's talk about our sex life to make it as good as we possibly can be. Once you've even said that much, the worst is over. You've said the word sex to your partner, can we talk? And then every single couple without fail said, oh my God, if I'd known it was this easy, we would have done it years ago. And how much easier is it when you can just talk openly and honestly to your partner about sex? That's how you get through the aging thing when you can say, oh my God, this is happening to me. What's happening to you? Yeah, this is happening to me. It's couples who get all funny about, you know, they'll talk about aging in every other sense, but they won't talk about aging of the genitals or anything like that. So it's, it's just, Once you start, yes, there will be that little bit of awkwardness, but once you keep going, it just goes so fast. And there are lots of sex conversation starters in there. So you can have a little script. But another thing, if you want to try something new, I always think the best thing to do is to wake up in the morning, you go, oh my God, I just had this most amazing dream that we were doing X. And then your partner will either go, what? Like, that sounds awful. <laughs> or, or you pervert or, you know, something. Or they'll go, oh, that sounds interesting. So it's a very easy way <laughs> to suss out whether they're interested in doing something else. 
Wow. So Tracy, so what else are you doing? Are, do you, are you on a TV show now? I know you've done like your bio is so long. You've done a million things already. What else do you, you have this book coming out? What? Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm not on TV. No, by my choice, actually, um, because I feel like I've done all that. And you know what? It's really hard work working with real life couples and traipsing about the countryside. I feel like I'm a bit over that now. Um, so I do um, two sex story ranges with Love Honey. I do um, books. I do my blog and, and I do, I don't know, I seem to spend my life doing publicity or just talking about sex on different different mediums so I keep thinking it's going to calm down soon but it hasn't and I don't really want it to calm down of course um so um, so I think the next thing is because of lockdown we haven't been able to redesign any new toys so that would be my next thing would be to redesign the ranges and that's fun coming up with sex toys that's great wow. fun Oh my gosh. This is so funny. This is twice in one week because I just interviewed another author who's written this literary fiction. It's called Good Company coming out, Cynthia Sweeney. And I, I, was, oh, yeah. research, I was researching her. She wrote The Nest and she wrote a whole article about sex toys in the New York Times, which like kicked off her career. So like that was yesterday. And now I'm talking to you. I don't know what's going on. I feel like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe the gods are talking to me or something pretty funny might be might be oh my god, god so that was when did she write the article because like like 100 years ago like 20 oh i see like, i see right. you know yeah. i think it was like 2007 or something like that yeah uh, right anyway, i was about to i say. happened to have read it and it kicked off her <laughs> career and all the rest oh my gosh oh, so good for her. um wow so aside from doing publicity like where do you see this going do you want to help more people with books or do you like, I, cause I am, the reason I'm asking in part is I have these anthologies and in my first anthology, I had a, a whole section called moms don't have time to have sex. And I had a bunch of people write essays about it, but then mm. I like have let it go since then. And I'm, and I keep thinking like, I have to bring this back because so many people were like flipping to that section and being like, what did they say in there? Um, and I want to figure out a way to like make this a more accessible topic because this is something, you know, girlfriends confide to each other but a lot of them don't yeah. talk openly enough and it does cause so much destruction and then next thing you know you, you know your whole life is mm. anyway so <laughs> so I think yeah I think yeah books are a very important way I mean any media um I think books and podcasts I think podcasts are an excellent way actually to talk about sex because sometimes like you said you, you're reading your book on a reader or your laptop but you still got the husband looking over your shoulder or whatever so if you are embarrassed you can have earphones in and no one's going to listen you know no one can hear what you're hearing so it might be if people are really embarrassed that podcast is the way to go but um but I think yeah we just all need to um, it's quite interesting, you know, because I think the world divides into some people that I talk to and I say, do you talk to your partner about sex? And they're like, yeah, of course I do. And others are like, oh, no, of course I don't. And it seems to be the great divide about couples who are just incredibly open, especially younger generation. And then people post 40, I suppose, I think you get a lot less people talking about sex. And it's a shame because it is the only way that you ever go, you're never going to get through your whole life with somebody if you intend to stay with them, or even a, even two years on, unless you can talk through your sex problems, you will not make it. Interesting. Well, I feel like now you should host Moms Don't Have Time to Have Sex. <laughs> well, maybe I will. I'm not even <laughs> kidding. I feel like we should talk after this. And I should like you should do a podcast for me or something. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Why don't you don't have your own podcast? No, I don't. And the reason why I was going to start up a podcast. And then when I started doing the publicity for the book, everybody's got a podcast. And I thought, well, maybe there's not room for more. I don't know. But yeah, I would like to do a podcast and, and I'd love to do a podcast with you. But um, so it is It is interesting that, I mean, who's listening to all these podcasts? I must do. There's so many of them. <laughs> I, and yeah, everyone's listening to yours. But I mean, I don't know about the rest of them. <laughs> so funny it's i know i've crazy I've, I've been on a bunch lately to promote my book and i, I know there's so many podcasts and um yeah. i am particularly even that good at listening to podcasts because i feel like i record them all day long um uh, yeah. i listen for like competitive reasons right like research and, and things like that but um, yeah. Yeah. how long have you been doing delighted. also i've been doing been... three years i've been doing it all right okay so you came in at the beginning and that's why well yours is successful for many reasons but um i think if you if you're like i think the lockdown everybody just decided to do a podcast i mean and it's just become the thing now hasn't it whereas yours is well established and well run and it's not easy doing a podcast either you've got to do it properly i mean god i don't know how you fit in everything i don't either you're the, the world's busiest woman i swear i, I know <laughs> I know I, my inbox has become completely unmanageable and I just like look at it sometimes and laugh. I think you just like have to have a sense of humor. I'm just yeah. like, 
Like I'm debating putting an auto reply being like, I cannot get to all these. I don't give me, a, I, I don't know, I'm getting there. But like, it's not just me. It's like everyone, I, everybody is just overwhelmed in so many different ways. So, yeah. Um, but at least it's fun. I don't know. I just have to laugh because otherwise. Yeah, better too busy than not busy. That would be just awful. Yes, I agree. Um, okay. And I've been oh. there, you know, I've been at home with my kids on the yeah. floor. Like, I miss my brain. <laughs> I bet. I never, I didn't have kids. I couldn't have kids, but I don't know whether I would have had them anyway, but I've got a little stepdaughter now. And, um, and just step parenting her is like, God, this is hard. I don't think I could have stayed at home. I don't think I could not have stayed at home with the baby. I think I would have been utterly useless. Oh my I'm not God. patient enough. I'm not patient enough. Um, do you have any um, advice to aspiring authors? Um, I think writing nonfiction is very different than writing fiction. Um, I had a stab at that and I was absolutely rubbish. Um, nonfiction, you can, I think, even if you're not feeling creative, get some words down on the page. Like I'm sure fiction, that's it's easier to say for nonfiction than fiction because you can do your research, you can do your interviews. But just, you know, writing's a muscle, you know, you just have to get used to sitting down and getting the words out every single day. I don't think I've ever sat down and thought, you know what, I can't write today. I've never had the luxury of that, actually. If you've got deadlines, you just have to meet them. So yeah, just sit down and write anything. Just get yourself writing something. Yeah, it's like give a busy person something to do. Same point. Yes. You just. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Awesome. Well, Tracy, this has been so much fun and also helpful on many levels. And Good. the book was really awesome and everyone should read it because it's really not just a 50. I mean, I mean, I'm in my forties. It's completely, all of it is completely relevant because so much of it is relationship advice. But of course, if they don't want that, you have like 8,000 other books you've written. So um, <laughs> I'm just like a platter of, uh, of sex books. So um, anyway, I'll be in touch because I really think that it would be really awesome if you did that podcast. I think- Yeah, I'd love to, absolutely. Really, really want to listen and, uh, um, you know, it'd be better, as you said, than my laptop in the, you know, yeah. <laughs> in, the kid, in the kid land and everything. With the kids so. wandering in. <laughs> more on that to come. But, uh, but thank you. This was really, really fun. Oh, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.